The preparations for the Feast of Yuletide begin on the 5th of December. On this day, the barriers between the mundane and the realms beyond weaken, releasing the magic of the season. From Helheim, the son of Hel, the half-corpse half-alive daughter of Loki the trickster, steps from the realm of the dead and plants his black hooves on the snow-ridden ground. Krampus, a dreadful fiend, a goat that walks like a man, a jagged-toothed beast from man's worst nightmare. His clawed spindly fingers are bent in a perpetual arthritic grip, and in one palm he holds a branch of birch with which he punishes the wicked. Rusted chains encircle his body, and cowbells decorate the links. Those who hear the awful dull clanging of bells know that the horror of Christmas has come. When Krampus sees a mortal with a soul as black as his fur, his forked tongue lolls in drooling anticipation. On Krampusnacht, the night of Krampus, the black mangoat stalks the streets and enters homes in search of those who have been naughty and had not observed the preparations for Yuletide. To the misbehaving children, he gives lumps of coal and branches of birch for their parents to better discipline them. Those who have been truly wicked before Christmas should expect the personal judgment of Krampus. The unfortunate souls who Krampus deems wanting shall feel the lick of his private branch and in the worst case be hauled off to Helheim in a basket to work in the coal mines for a year collecting presents for the naughty children of next Christmas. As the magic of Christmas seeps into the world of men, even the barriers of Jotunheim wane, allowing a certain Jotun to cross the encircling sea. Gryla, a Jotun woman, but not as mighty as her ancestors or peers. She is a hunchbacked repulsive and feeble specimen of her race. She stalks the streets and villages, knocking on doors and begging children for her dinner. An average Jotun would not be denied, nor beg for man flesh, so something is definitely wrong with Gryla. Perhaps, this is the very reason she can pass the barrier set by Odin. The other Jotun are far too powerful to cross over, while the begging wretch finds the crossing as easy as going through a hole in the fence. The cretinous Jotun can be chased off fairly easily, as she will cower at shouting and threats of violence. Those of not so confrontative disposition might toss food and drink at Gryla to distract her long enough to shut their doors. A thousand sticks might hit her, and a thousand upon thousand households might deny her, but it is said that Gryla never goes hungry during Yuletide. The parents of the truly naughty children have no quarrel with their progeny going missing one night, as a hunched monstrous woman, with a sack, walks away from their porch, back to Jotunheim. For those of morbid curiosity, Gryla prefers her children in a stew, cooked soft and tender, clothes, teeth, hair, and all. This, however, is just one version of Gryla. In other versions, Gryla is neither a weakling nor a beggar. She is a mighty ogress who forcefully takes what is hers. In the mountains of Iceland, in the dangerous caves of the Dimuborgia lava, lives a gigantic ugly witch who has a taste for human flesh, an insatiable hunger for the flesh of children, especially naughty children. With eyes at the back of her head, a big nose covered in warts, teeth as black as coal and sharp as razors, a hunchback and long flappy ears which reached her nose, she is a fright to behold, a hideous troll, an evil ogress. This is the popular version of Gryla, and she is the big bad growler. 
She has long bony fingers, and cloven hooves for feet, a donkey tail from behind, and reeks of dead meat. She carries a gigantic bag, every yuletide season, searching for children to feast on. Some say she has forty tails, and on the nights of Christmas, Gryla comes down from her mountains, holding one hundred sacks on each of her forty tails, and a sword in her hand. In the sacks, she stuffed naughty children, and with the sword, she carved out their stomach. Then she brings them home, where she cooks them into stew. That is her favorite meal, stewed children. Gryla knows all the children who have been misbehaving all year round. Her long big nose can smell that air of rot carried by every nasty child, and because children will always misbehave, there is never a shortage of food for Gryla. A family of monsters as well, this giant ogress has. She has thirteen mischievous sons, who cause all manner of troubles, playing pranks on people during the Christmas season. They call them the Yule Lads. Gryla has a lazy troll of a husband, who does nothing all year, but only helps her hunt and stash children into her big bag for their Christmas meal. Neither her husband nor her children are as dreadful as Gryla herself, but, alas, there is one last member of the family who is. And they call this one, the Yule Cat. This pet belongs to Gryla, and is another flesh-eating monster we shall soon know about. Gryla may be a child-devouring monster, but that is not to say she sees all children the same way. The Jotun and her husband, Lepaludi, a Jotun equally as disgusting as Gryla, had thirteen children, who, like their parents, also enjoy the torment of mortals during the month of December. These thirteen young Jotun are called the Yule Lads, each of whom shall bring a unique torment every day for thirteen days. The first, Stekjaster, arriving on the twelfth, and leaving on Christmas Day, while Giliagawa, the second of the lads, shall arrive after his brother, and leave on the twenty-sixth. The first Yule lad, Stekjaster, will harass sheep with his peg legs, kicking them and poking them, until the animals run away. Giliagawa, will steal the milk from cows, and harass them for good measure. Stufa, the third, is not as horrible as his brothers, as he only eats the burnt crust, off pans, since his stubby frame is no higher than the stove. Dvaraslakia is as miserable as his stubby brother, but of no fault of his own, as he only eats what he can find on dirty spoons. With Potiskville around, the kitchen will be without leftovers for the following morning. A Skarlika comes after to steal the pots which Dvaraslakia has emptied. So now, the family has neither leftovers nor a pot. Her Daskalia will make sure the household receives no sleep by slamming the doors all night. Skiagama will empty the larder of Skaya, which is a cream product similar to yogurt. Jignakriku leaves no sausages behind. Glugajitra peeps through windows, pressing his wart-ridden nose on the glass, as he plans what to steal from the house. Gatafur can sniff flatbread from across the village with his monstrous nose. Ketkroker comes for the cut meats with his hook. And finally, Kurtisnika comes to steal the tallow candles for food. After the rampage of the thirteen for thirteen days, the houses of those unfortunate shall be left without candles for warmth, or possessions beyond the walls, roof and chimney.
Gryla has a cat, unfortunately. This cat is no ordinary feline and is as vicious as her mistress. Her ferocity comes close to the black and sharp fanged Fenrir wolf, if not equal. To fall prey to this purring beast means inevitable death. This beast is called Yolokurterin, or the Christmas cat. As snow falls for the first time, it is important for the peoples of the north to have good clean and whole wooden clothes to protect them from the cold. An hour outside, in improper clothes, will turn the body frigid and sluggish, the perfect prey for a lazy cat. Those who are lost in the cold nights of December had better watch out for a horrible yowl as a giant mass of black fur stomps their way. Those with warm and thick wool can better defend themselves, while those who wear rags on their back can only shiver in the cold before a pair of yellow eyes approaches from the darkness. The tales of winter reign predominantly in the north, where the northern lights lash across the sky, and the cold of Niflheim clutches the earth in a crunching and squeaking grip. But one creature of Christmas visits the east for his mayhem, where the palms and figs grow. This creature is the horrible Christmas goblin, Karakonkolos. Karakonkolos is quite similar to Krampus, as he too, is a goat, who walks on two legs, and lives in Helheim, but is better dressed for the southern climate. Instead of the long coat of fur, attached by chains, and decorated by cowbells, Karan Konkolos terrorizes the world, in the nude. The Goblin of Christmas, lives in the caves of Nordstrand, with Nide Hogru, the drake who chews on the root of the world tree, Yggdrasil. Together, the two work to bring down the great ash, spelling the end of the world. But on the 25th of December, Karan Konkolos gets distracted by the sudden surge of magic from the mortal world, puts down his axe, and climbs to terrorize mortals for twelve days, which the peoples of the East refer to as godless days. Similar way to most Christmas fiends, Karan Konkolo senses the wicked, and ruins their lives the best he can. Those, who are unfaithful to their spouses, should take care to watch the tops of their doorframes, for the hairy goblin, for his favorite pastime, is to ride these adulterers, to and through the forest, until they collapse. During the time Karan Konkolo brings havoc to the world, his work on the world tree, had time to heal, and the world can sigh in relief, for Ragnarok has a while to arrive yet. As the wild hunt of Odin descends upon the world, to bring horror and havoc to the dark woods of Midgard, one might see a glowing figure among the honored dead, the Einheya. A woman in white garb, stained with blood, and a crown of fiery candles that spill burning yellow tallow on her mouth of jagged fangs. This is Lucy. Lucy is not amongst the dead who received the honor to fight, drink and eat in Valhalla until Ragnarok, but instead, a woman from the depths of Niflheim, her heart black with vengeance. Lucy is one of the creatures of the wild hunt, which is to say, that the demonic appearance and malevolent nature is a common thing in the wild hunt, as the procession of carnage and slaughter attracts several bloodthirsty fiends and warriors from all the realms. On the 13th of December, during the day of Saint Lucia, the martyred saint's evil counterpart, 
departs from the wild hunt, to seek those who have not adhered to the preparations for Lucy's night, or night of Saint Lucia. The bloody demon will descend from the chimney, dragging soot and logs, and then will slaughter the entire household in their sleep. Those who have prepared and kept a vigil for the night shall be spared from Lucy's wrath, for the demon hates merrymaking and light, preferring to live in darkness and the quiet of the grave. On the highest peaks of the Alps, lives a lonely crone, who descends upon the villages below, on the 12th of December. This one, is called Frau Perchter. Frau Perchter has the appearance of a woman, but with a nose so long, it acts as her beak. The beaked crone of the mountains, hates lazy and disobedient children, seeking them with a basket, in a similar fashion to Gryla, the Jotun. That is not to say, that adults are spared from her ire, if they had not cleaned their houses for the season. On a good hunt, Frau Perchter will leave the lowlands with a basket, full of screaming children, who she will spare for a later meal. On the following morning, the villagers scream at the carnage of last night. Several houses are doused in blood, as their former occupants lie on the ground their bellies slit open. The people will know the culprit, when they see, that the innards of the victims, had been replaced with stones, the calling card of Frau Perchter. Unlike the other fiends, Perchter actually rewards those, who had been diligent throughout the year, and cleaned their houses for Christmas. These good people will not receive the horrible woman inside their houses, but at their doorstep, Frau Perchter will leave the good family, a silver coin, before disappearing, without fanfare, or explanation. One fiend stands out from the rest, for being no more than a mortal man, while his counterparts are goblins, jotun, monstrous cats, demons, or demigods. During the Middle Ages, lived a couple that hated life and children. On one December day, Pera Futar and his wife, noticed three young boys from good families, leaving school for their winter holidays. Racked with jealousy, after living in squalor and poverty, the couple decided to drug, murder, and flay the boys, out of sheer malice, curing their hides into leather. Unfortunately for the two, Saint Nicholas happened to see the crime, and used the old magic of bones and skin, to resurrect the boys, as a miracle of Christmas. As punishment for Pera Futar and his wife, he gave them the curse of eternal life and eternal servitude, to the generous saint. That is not to say, that Pera Futar changed his ways, and became as generous and kind as his new lord. Instead, Saint Nicholas harnessed the mean and horrible nature, of the eternal curmudgeon, and kept him as his counterpart. As Nicholas gave out gifts to the kind and good, Pera Futar doled out punishment, to the unkind and bad. On the 6th of December, when Saint Nicholas rides around the world, his new servant, rides along with him. While the generous man of legend, wears a golden robe, giving blessings and gifts, Pera Futar, wears a black leather cloak, and yells obscenities and threats, to those around him. The naughty shall know Pera Futar by his other name, Father Flog, as he can sniff out the misbehaved and wretched, around Saint Nicholas, assaulting them with his sticks. Futar is so diligent, 
that he has to carry a whole basket of sticks, as he breaks several, during his duty. Those, truly wicked, shall be taken away by the flock father, to be punished for the rest of the year, until next Christmas. <laughs>